Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on the top 10 OSHA violations and how to avoid them. My name is Reynolds Whalen. I'm the Director of Sales Operations here at Weber and Grinnell Insurance. And uh, I'm just thrilled to invite uh, to, to welcome you all this morning, especially uh, those in upstate New York in a construction trailer. We got 10 to 15 folks there who are contractors and subcontractors using this as part of a monthly education series. We got some folks out on Nantucket uh, in New Hampshire. So we've got a nice reach this morning all over New England. We're glad to have everybody here. Before I introduce our three panelists, uh, I'd like to go through a few quick housekeeping items. So uh, the first is you can at any time, you can use the chat feature if you look at the bottom of your screen uh, to comment You know, if you're having trouble hearing or if there's a technical issue or if you have a question. There's also a Q&A box down there. So I'll be monitoring that uh, throughout. I'll act as the moderator for our webinar today. So throw them in there whenever you've got something to, to say or have a question for the panelists. Uh, we're also doing a transcription, a live transcription. So if you're seeing uh, subtitles right now, uh, that's to make this more accessible, but you can always turn them off just by finding the CC button at the bottom and you can hide the transcription if it's bothering you. Uh, we are recording this and we'll send the recording out afterward for you to use as a resource. And uh, we'll also send out the slides we're using today as a, a, a PDF for you to reference. All right, I'm gonna do some quick introductions and then hand it over uh, to my friend Matt to kick us off. But uh, first I wanna introduce Brett Fortin, who is the Compliance Assistant Specialist for OSHA Springfield Area Office. Can you say a quick hello, Brett? Uh, good morning, all. Uh, so Brett worked as an iron worker for the Naval Construction Force, uh, where he got his Bachelor of Science in Occupational Safety and Health. And he did that for, for 20 years with the Naval Construction Force and joined OSHA in 2014 as a Compliance Safety and Health Officer until he moved into his current position in 2020. So a lot of experience with Brett. We're going to get a lot of great insight today. Uh, we're really happy to have you, Brett. Thanks for joining us. Uh, next up, Ralph Thresher, who's our senior safety consultant here at Weber and Grinnell. Say a quick hello, Ralph. Good morning, everybody. Great to have Ralph as always. Uh, Ralph helps our clients in a big way doing mock OSHA inspections, uh, helping them with safety and compliance issues, forming safety committees, all, all things safety to keep everyone uh, on track and make sure everyone's staying safe at their organization. And he has 35, more than 35 years now of experience as a safety consultant. He started with Aetna in the early 80s where he specialized in construction. Uh, and then he also worked for Utica. So he has experience with the, on the carrier side as well. Um, and for another agency before he joined us in 2017. So Ralph, good as always to have you here. Thanks. He's a legend. Ralph's a legend around here. <laughs> All right. And then uh, last but not least, we got Matt Geffen, uh, who is a partner here at Weber and Grinnell. Uh, he joined in 2009. He's been instrumental in developing our risk platform, uh, which you'll hear about in this webinar. Uh, Matt, can you say a quick hello? Quick hello. <laughs> Thanks, bud. Ralph uh, is a legend, by the way. I just got to throw that in there. Sure is. So Matt, yeah, Matt's a, a trusted advisor for all of our clients. Uh, helps them with all things insurance, uh, helps with safety as well, kind of with Ralph as a team, uh, and, and really just knows the insurance piece in and out. Uh, and we're going to start today, I'm going to hand it over to Matt in a minute about framing this conversation uh, and why it's important and how we're going to approach it. So before I do that, here's how this is going to work. We've identified the top 10 violations from 2021 based on the number of citations and we're going to go through each one, talk a little bit about the data, share some anecdotes. Ralph and uh, Brett are in the field every day on this stuff. You'll hear some insight there. And then we're also going to give you a few takeaways for how to make sure you're staying compliant, uh, which is, is going to be great for, for you moving forward. So without further ado, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand it over to Matt, and he's going to set us up with just some context here. So Matt, take it away, buddy. Oh, wait. All right. Sorry, oh. I lied. There's a uh, obligatory slide here on uh, 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 OSHA, you know, some some OSHA um, stuff about, uh, you know, just regulations and everything. So you can read that later. We've got it recorded. So just, uh, you know, they're not responsible for things, basically. All right. Over to you, Matt. All right. Well, I'm glad you weren't going to read that. I got a little nervous for a second. So. <laughs> 
Um, all right, great. Thanks, and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're um, we're excited to be doing this webinar this morning. It's an important topic. Um, it's one we deal with almost every day, definitely every week. And, and a great question we were talking about as we prepared for this is, well, why are we doing it? Why are we here? Um, and obviously, first and foremost, it's important from a compliance standpoint to understand what, what OSHA expects of you, right? You're the employer. Your, your job in protecting the health and safety of employees is, um, is really imp an important one. And so, again, this is, this is critical in understanding from a compliance standpoint what you're expected to do. But secondary to that is, you know, why are a bunch of insurance guys talking about OSHA compliance and, and, and why does that play a role here? Um, and I think it's important to understand that OSHA does play a critical role in strategically manning, managing your organization's um, risk and ultimately driving down costs of your insurance. And, and why is that? Um, I think the reason is pretty simple. Commercial underwriting and the way we price risks is a very subjective process. It, it relies on human underwriters to make a pricing decision based on your business. And there are a lot of factors that go into it. Um, underwriters are really trying to price your business and price your risk to fund for future losses. And so if a company's not paying attention to safety standards, they're not OSHA compliant, and, and just generally is not thoughtfully managing operations safely, then the likelihood for losses is higher. And, and thus, an underwriter has got to price that risk higher than someone else. Obviously, conversely, if, if, a, if I train my employees, if I adhere to safety standards, if I've got a high level of care regarding the safety of my organization, losses are less likely. And thus, your insurance cost does not need to be as high because they don't have to fund for future losses. So, Again, accidents happen. That's why we call them accidents. But our job is to stop those preventable ones. And so, um, again, it's really important that we're paying attention to this as we try and drive down our cost of risk. Um, so, again, that's why we're here. I'm excited to talk through this. I'm going to mute it and hand it over to the pros on OSHA. Awesome. All right. So we're going to jump right in here and uh, start with number 10. So we're going to work our way up. Uh, with the most common uh, violations that we're seeing in 2021. Number 10 is on machine guarding. So on each of these slides, you'll see the OSHA reference number if you wanna look at anything in greater detail. So with machine guarding, uh, we, we've got some stats for you. Uh, in 2021, there were over a thousand citations, 1,113 for this, for machine guarding violations. Um, this is the cause of approximately 300 deaths annually. So I think it's important to take a step back at the beginning here and note that this isn't just obviously about insurance and risk and your company's risk. This is about people and health and safety. This is about uh, fathers and husbands and mothers and people and their lives. And it's just really important. And it, it, I, for me, it's just really telling when we see these numbers, uh, how much harm it's causing when people aren't, aren't following this, um, you know, following the guidelines. So uh, there's also approximately 1,500 serious injuries annually. So machine guarding is definitely a really important topic. So I'm going to hand it over to Ralph and uh, Brett to talk a little more about uh, some things they see in the field. And we've got some pictures as well here. Right. This is a horizontal bandsaw. And what we wanted to focus on was the cutting surface. If you'll notice the blade running across, and it's the, the blade guard to the right should be extended over so that only the cutting area is exposed to the blade as opposed to having that area as well you know being open so that somebody inadvertently could uh unfortunately injure themselves right you want to add to that uh really the the thing to look at mostly with these this is a common thing that is found in most shops where these exist um, is making sure that uh, employees understand and know that um, as you adjust stock, you're, you're going to have to take the time to adjust the, the blade guard also. Um, typically, we find it in places that do a lot of different uh, stock and they forget to adjust that blade cover back. So it's extremely important that they understand that. Of course, we have the infamous table saw without the blade guard, the splitter on the, on the back. And uh, the other thing that I like to look at is the housekeeping you know, because sawdust is very flammable. So a couple of things to add with that, it is it is missing the kickback fingers. 
Um, mm -hmm. it, it's also missing the spreader bar. Uh, typically where most accidents happen here is because the blade becomes bound upon the work that it's doing, particularly when you're trying to cut a smaller piece. Uh, and with those items removed, you now have uh, a, what would be called a caught by problem where the blade will actually catch the wood, pull it or push it, and then bring your hand into contact. And this obviously is, you know, just missing guards of any type. Uh, the on off switch should be labeled so they can tell if it's on or off, you know, if there's a power interrupt problem. But basically, you're looking at something that I call homemade. And, you know, it's always best not to do that because you got to you got to comply with the ANSI standards at a minimum. I think this might be the last one on on this. And then, of course, the drill press, you know, just quick things that I see is you have the chuck key sitting in the actual uh, chuck so that should somebody inadvertently turn this thing on before removing it, it's gonna come flying out and hit somebody. Uh, no chuck guard. And then of course, they've got a little fluorescent light bulb that's sitting in there and there's no cover to protect it from getting broken. Got anything gotcha. else? Ben? So, uh, that was, you know, some nitty gritty stuff, uh, but we've pulled out a few in each of these uh, 10 violations. We've pulled out three to five reasons that we see most commonly in the field. So uh, Brett will go over these quickly, too. You go ahead and put them all up, um, Reynolds. We'll, we'll go over them one by yep, one. Um, so employees have removed guards and, and no one replaced them. So um, for whatever reason, uh, a particular employee removed a guard, uh, whether it be for maintenance reasons, uh, the guard was not functioning properly or was damaged. Um, it made their, their tasks as they consider it instead of notifying management um, more difficult. So they removed the guard. Um, this is a big one. This is probably the number one reason we find um, unguarded machinery is that no one is following behind these individuals to ensure that it's put back on, particularly when you do some type of maintenance um, uh, operation. And, and again, that needs to be labeled in your lockout tagout program is to put the guard back after you've completed the task. Um, no facility inspection to detect missing guards. Um, so again, is making sure that management understands what machines they need to pay attention to. Um, sometimes they can, uh, if they're expanded metal, they can paint these guards yellow. Uh, that's a key indicator. So individuals see something missing or a, a piece of yellow gear, and then there's a hole in the middle where something should have been. It, it keys them in quickly. Um, lack of knowledge, both on the employee's response, uh, area and on management's part, knowing whether or not there is a, is a hazard. Is there a caught by, caught between? Uh, is it in running nip points? Um, where exactly they're required? Do I have exposed hex key ends? Um, homemade equipment. Uh, making sure that yes, you can you can fashion guards at your establishment. However, there's very strict rules on, on when you can do that. Number one, it cannot create a greater hazard. So in other words, if you fashion the guard, it cannot con it, it can't interfere with the machine's normal production and create a, a general larger hazard. It must be substantial. In other words, it must protect against what it's protecting against, whether it be putting your hands in places, things like that, or centrifugal forces, belt drives, things like that. So so making sure that if you are going to fashion guards, um, that there is the knowledge there about what the hazard is and, and how to not create an additional hazard. Um, yeah, as always, you can always call experts in. Uh, there are safety engineers that can do that. You can call most of these firms and, and tell them what your machine is, and they can guide you in what you need to put on there. Great. Go ahead, Ralph. Yeah, so Ralph's going to go through um, some tips for avoiding these accidents and violations. Uh, Ralph, you want to do them one by one or just throw them all up like we do with Brett? Yeah, you can, you can throw them all up. All right. Go. As Brett was mentioning, you know, try to avoid the homemade equipment or the guarding at, unless it meets the ANSI standards. Uh, if you, you're finding that the guards are removed, of course, you want to make sure that employees receive training about why the guards are important and then monitor them to make sure that things are being put back after they've been removed, say, for maintenance. Uh, training the employees, how to inspect the equipment for proper guarding. Before anybody's ever, you know, walks over to fire up a piece of equipment, you know, they should be just doing a quick check to make sure the guards are in place. Along with that, you know, if you have uh, sliding doors with interlocks on them, it's not a bad idea to make sure the interlocks are functioning properly. And then lastly, 
if you have a situation where you have people that like to routinely take guards off, they do need to be disciplined. You should document it. Great. Thanks, Ralph. So some of you may be sitting here thinking, well, I don't really have many machines in my operation because of how my business is. And I want to assure you there's nine more of these. And I, I guarantee you some, at least some of these are going to apply to everyone on the call. Um, so in case you're like, well, is this going to be useful for me? There's, there's a lot of stuff here. So um, any questions? I don't see any questions yet, uh, but just remind people we're going to take questions throughout. So you don't be shy or hesitant if you have any questions about any of these. So um, not seeing any, I'm going to move on to number nine here. So the number nine is powered industrial trucks. So some data on this. Um, there were 1,420 citations for this in 2021. This uh, on average causes 85 deaths annually and uh, over 34, almost 35,000 serious injuries annually on average. So obviously a, a, a important topic. So let's get into some details here. Now this forklift, as you can see, it was parked, no operator in it and the load is still elevated. Anytime a forklift's parked, the loads are supposed to be lowered to the ground. And, uh, and of course, set the parking brake. Next slide. I would tend to say the operator on this one did not know what the load rating was for the forklift, as well as knowing what the load was that he was picking up. Because uh, once you raise the forks on a forklift, you're changing the whole center of gravity. The forklift can lift a lot less. And unfortunately, this is the result. This one was the trailer or truck managed to move away from the dock while the forklift was either uh, partway in it or had been backing out of it. And it's always good to make sure that your driver, if they're in the truck, that they've set the brake and they've gotten back out of the truck if at all possible so you don't have to worry about them pulling it ahead. Uh, nowadays, you know, it's always great to have trailers with the uh, chuck blocks so that the trailer is not just going to routinely roll away. And of course, a lot of the, you know, docks nowadays actually have this uh, locking mechanism on the dock. So once the trailer is backed up, it actually grabs a hold of the ICC bumper so that the trailer can't be removed until they release the lock. And of course, we have the infamous forklift cage and forklift cages present uh, some really interesting hazards because first and foremost, the operator of the forklift, you want to make sure, you know, is a very qualified person because that person that's in this basket, you know, really doesn't have any control over anything that that forklift is going to do. So unfortunately, you know, people have gotten crushed from the operator raising them up and not paying attention and all of a sudden they get caught under a beam. Uh, the cage itself should be secured to the forks. The forklift manufacturer, you're supposed to contact them and make sure it's okay to use this particular forklift basket with that fork truck and get there okay. You'll see there's a fall protection harness sitting there uh, if they're going to, you know, keep a fall protection harness, they should be keeping it in an area away from uh, basically chemicals, uh, just weather hazards, anything like that. And then if you're going to hang, it should be hung by the D-ring in the back. Um, Brett, what would you like to add to that one? Uh, just a couple of things to remember with some of the older baskets. Uh, there is a requirement that that hinge be spring loaded. It must automatically close. Um, if that spring mechanism is broken, it has to be repaired. Um, the other thing with the fall protection gear is making sure that you're inspecting it prior to every use. Um, and then the chaining or the locking mechanism that keeps it attached to the machine has to be engaged before anybody enters that basket. Um, and, and again, it, it has to either be pinned or chained uh, depending on the, the manufacturer's design of that. Do they need to have a written program to use baskets like as a part of you know, their overall fork lift program? 
Uh, yes, there has to be training that's on it, um, and that training has to be documented. Anytime uh, now at general industry, the introduction of the new uh, walking working surfaces in 2015, uh, don't forget that there's also a requirement to train individuals on the use of the equipment, how to inspect it, um, making sure that they select the, cor the correct lanyards. Um, all of that has to be covered under 1910.29, uh, which is the training for fall protection. They need to make sure that that is not only performed with anybody that's going to do work in that, but that it is documented that it was done. This is one of the ones that has a physical requirement to document training. Um, so some, some of the things that we see in the field, again, transporting uh, elevated loads, you're supposed to bring the load down to a, uh, a safe level, depending on what exactly the load is, uh, immediately once you clear any type of obstacles. You should not be driving with this, um, this load 70, you know, however many feet in the air. Um, you never operate a forklift with employees in a man basket. It is supposed to be stationary and only used to go up and down. You do not actually move the forklift while the employee is operating the basket. Um, not securing trailers to docks with locks or chalk blocks. Um, again, there's a lot of letters of interpretation out there that talk about this. Um, you know, you have the positive locking mechanism, uh, but making sure that whoever's occupying that vehicle that is back to the dock, it has a positive way to control uh, any of the movement of that vehicle should you need to put a powered industrial truck in the back of it. Uh, Everybody thinks of forklifts when they talk of powered industrial trucks. It doesn't just include them. Right on pallet jacks are also considered powered industrial trucks. Uh, untrained or poorly trained operators. Now, again, uh, when we look at that is, are you training your operators in, in the use of this equipment? The hazards associated with this equipment, uh, is that training, and again, by 1910-178, it is required that this training be documented. Um, so making sure that that's done. Um, and then if you observe that you have employees that don't seem to completely grasp the concept of operating this is not just turning a blind eye to it, to addressing with it. It may be that the employee is just not comfortable using it. You may have to move them to another piece of equipment. Um, but again, it, it becomes a liability, not just to yourself, but your employees and those on foot that may be around these individuals. Um, horseplay and speeding, they lead to almost all accidents, almost Every accident I've ever investigated that involved a pit involved speeding. They were going too fast for the conditions in the warehouse. Um, that needs to be monitored. It should also be trained to your employees by posting signs, by saying, hey, this is the speed limit that you're allowed to do in here, uh, particularly when you start dealing with employees that are gonna be on foot around them. Uh, Seatbelts not worn. Again, if it's equipped with a seatbelt, it has to be worn. Uh, if it's not equipped with a seatbelt, it's an older model, then uh, you, you need to look at having that installed by a, uh, uh, authorized op um, authorized uh, distributor who's allowed by the manufacturer to do so. Basically, you for any powered industrial truck operation, you're supposed to have a documented training program, training the employees, and you know initially, and then after every three years, at an absolute minimum. Or if there's been uh, any accidents, incidents they're supposed to get retraining and you wanna document your retraining. Of course, never move loads with them elevated. Your uh, center of gravity is much higher and is, you're just apt to flip the forklift. Make certain the trailers are secured from movement. Monitor your inspections on all shifts because, uh, you know, quick story, ran into a local warehouse type uh, building materials dealer one night could hear some interesting noises coming down an aisle and lo and behold got a guy that's blowing donuts with a forklift in there they had cordoned off the aisle and he's sitting there blowing donuts it was really amazing to see and then of course wearing your seat belt always ground the forks when you're parking it and set the barking brake all right Number eight, so this is eye and face protection. And jumping right into that is uh, there were 1452 citations in 2021. Um, every single day, there's over 2000 eye injuries. This one was, this one was sort of shocking to me, uh, requiring medical treatment. So this is a, this is a huge one. Um, and there's over a hundred accidents that result in time away from work. So it's also affecting your wallet as a business owner. Now, this was a TikTok video, and this particular gentleman 
you know, you'll notice it says, because I just did. Well, you can imagine what he was talking about. Basically, he was using a, from what I could tell, it was a type one cutting wheel with a type 27 guard. The type one cutting wheel is flat. The type 27 guard is a cupped guard. And when I was looking at the pictures, the what was remaining of the cutting wheel was within a, I'd say a 16th of an inch of the edge of the uh, guard that was on the equipment. So obviously when the wheel flexed a little bit, he probably contacted the edge of the guard, which then caused the wheel, which was rotating it on this one was around, I believe 9,000 RPM. And it just came flying up. And fortunately for him, it didn't hit him, but it's darn close as you can see in the pictures should have had safety glasses on as well but most important you know know the difference between the guards and which one you should be using i prefer to see a type one guard which is a fully enclosed half guard you know and a type one wheel as opposed to they do sell a type 27 wheel but the guard itself is you know half open so not impressive i know brett would like to add to that picture though uh, just the biggest thing to remember is that this type of, of PPE is for face and neck protection. It is not for eye protection. Um, the requirement to wear, uh, depending on what you're doing, you may be required to wear additional glasses underneath it. Um, because again, this is designed to protect your face and your neck area, uh, not your eyes. Um, and some of them, depending on the thickness and what they're graded for, might be an inferior guard to prevent something from contacting the eye. Now, when you go online and you read all the blogs, you'll you'll read so many people when they're using these little handheld grinders, they remove the guards, they refuse to use them. They say, oh, you, you read about people getting hurt, but oh, I've never had a problem. And that thing's spinning at 11,000 RPMs. Believe me, if you do something wrong, you will have a problem. I'm sorry, one thing to go over before I, I start on this is when, when OSHA talks about um, serious injury and illness, um, everybody kind of focuses on fatalities, but understand this, serious injury and illness is a life altering event. Um, some of these individuals can sustain injuries uh, that will stay with them the rest of their life, missing fingers, um, broken backs, um, these are soft tissue injuries, loss of an eye, something like that. So, so be aware that that's also included in the serious injuries when you take a look at this. Um, so again, uh, some of the reasons is they're not wearing PPE at all. Uh, for whatever reason, either they were issued it, they were issued incorrect PPE, or they just don't want to wear the PPE. Um, so management making sure that number one, you make sure you select PPE that can go across a broad selection of individuals. Sometimes that might mean looking at different types of glasses for different individuals. Um, we're not all born with the same facial features. Some have higher bridges on their noses, things like that. So understanding that um, some of the reasons why people, people don't wear it is it doesn't fit them or it continuously falls off. So it, it takes engagement with your employees. Um, improper protection for the operation, uh, going back to the grinder incident. So again, uh, yes, his face and neck were protected and luckily it didn't contact his eyes, but it, if doing that operation, he was also supposed to be wearing um, glasses underneath that shield. Uh, wearing it incorrectly. Um, one primary one to talk about with this would be a hard hat. Some hard hats, the uh, what they call the hard hat guts or the suspension can be flipped around to be worn backwards with the brim opposite. However, some hard hats cannot be, even though you can remove those the suspension and flip it around. It's not designed to be worn that way. So making sure you've got that. Um, also improper use of, of particular types of gloves, things like that. But mainly with the eye protection is again, not wearing the proper one for what you're doing. Uh, if you're cutting or welding, again, you got to make sure you select the right one. Um, the Z87 uh, rating, what that's going to mainly deal with is the shattering, how it covers the particular lens of the eye. Uh, it can't shatter and create additional shards that can come into the eye. Um, and ineffective machine guarding. Um, so with the grinder incident, a lot of people look at a grinder guard and they say, well, a grinder guard is there to protect against the shattering of the disc. Yes, it is. But it also directs where the spray goes. That's why it's made to move around 
the particular device. Sometimes you may have to start grinding and find out that the uh, metal shards are going in a direction you don't want them to. So you may have to make an adjustment there, but absolutely under no conditions should you remove that guard because not only do you take away the ability to control that, you also end up with a problem where an individual gets um, gets hurt because of, of, a, of a shattering blade. Go ahead, Ralph. Yep. So basically one of the things you're also supposed to do is have a personal protective equipment assessment that's proper for, you know, making sure the equipment you're using is proper for the job. And it is supposed to be documented. Uh, you're supposed to train your employees, of course, and then enforce and uh, enforce discipline. You know, make sure if they're not wearing it, they need re-education and then uh, making sure that they get disciplined for it. As far as the proper equipment and machinery safeguards, obviously, you know, you want to make sure that everybody's using the guarding that came with it and they're using the proper equipment for the job. Because a lot of times, you know, there's a safer way of doing something. So you have less of a chance of being injured by just changing, you know, what you're using for equipment instead of using that particular device. All right. Moving on to number seven. So fall protection, and this is specifically on training requirements for fall protection, because there's, as you probably know, lots of different um, approaches to fall protection with OSHA requirements. So we're going to start with these training requirements. And there were over 1,500 violations in 2021. Um, in construction alone in 2020, there were 351 fatal falls. Um, and there's over 25,000 fall slips and trips accounting for over 30% of construction accidents. And that's just within construction. You know, this is one, fall protection applies to many, many industries. Uh, so I think this is a good one that uh, can apply to many organizations here. And basically, first one, you have a gentleman that's straddling the top of a ladder, not supposed to be standing there. On You don't use the, the side that doesn't have the steps. Of course, you're not supposed to be on that top step or up on the black cap. Uh, in residences, you know, we're seeing these little giant ladders and they come equipped with the ladder bracket. You can put a plank on there now, the metal plank. Uh, just when I look at this just briefly, and I'm gonna let Brett interject on this, but you know, I'm looking at how does the person get up there? And then what do they have for fall protection? Because quite frankly, it appears as if they're up over 10 feet. Scaffold requires, you know, guardrails over 10 feet. You've got power lines right there. And then you see the ladder on the right side, you know, extension ladder. And I'm going to guess that that's what they're using for access. So he's got to step off to the left of the ladder going outside of the, uh, of the ladder rails. Not too impressed with that. Brett, take it from there. Uh, so really the, the, the number one thing to look at here is it, you're going to have two areas where falls are going to occur the most, um, where the individual is standing on the uh, platform uh, or as the industry calls it, a pick. Um, you have to be protected from falls and, and you can do that in several different ways, whether it be guardrails, nets, um, or the personal fall arrest system. Um, and then of course, the safe access to this. So the, the problem where the ladder is positioned is, is that you actually have to sidestep, turn your body to get onto the other platform. So stepping from the fiberglass ladder onto that, um, that that's going to be typically where that fall is going to occur um, when they leave on or off that ladder. Um, so again, the position needs to change so that they are protected from the falls. Um, while you're on the ladder, you don't have to have the fall protection on, but the minute you step onto the new platform, you do. And then when you're storing your fall protection gear, harnesses, lanyards, uh, you're not supposed to be leaving them outside in the snow or anywhere else where they can, uh, they're basically uh, coming into contact with weather, chemicals, or anything else that might damage them. They're supposed to be stored dry, supposed to be laid flat, supposed to be uh, away from any other hazards. And, you know, I've seen them many times they've been stored in gang boxes and then all the saws and other equipment get piled on top of them because they weren't going to use them for a few more days. Along with that, you know, each person that's using them is supposed to be trained in how to use them. And they're supposed to be uh, 
making sure that, you know, inspecting them before they put them on. Brett? Uh, so that was just a couple other things is the self-retracting lanyard that's that's hanging from the harness. Um, if you read the instructions, most of them will tell you it's supposed to be disconnected when not in use. And then there were actual specific requirements on how they're stored. Some of them require you to hang it by the D-ring on the top uh, from like a bar or a, an elevated surface. Um, and if you look at it, this one also has some fray marks uh, on the part that's coming out, which means it may take the initial stoppage hit and then may fail at that point. This is a commonplace in the, in the construction industry. You get a stairwell, it's been drywalled, no railings. So now you have the fall hazard, anybody going up and down. You have to have railings in place for the making sure that nobody's falling. Or at least if they do slip and fall, that they can, uh, they can catch themselves. The other thing to watch for, of course, housekeeping wise, just looking, there's a little bit of debris on the stairs. And of course, you got the ladder at the bottom, which is just leaning there. Brett? I don't have anything to add to that fiction. No. Um, so, so making sure again, now this doesn't, the, the larger number of inspections were around uh, construction, but don't forget in general industry under 191029, you also have a training requirement. So 503 is the construction side under 1926 and 29 is gonna be under 1910. So, so making sure that you understand that that is required across all. Um, and a lot of reasons is, is that inadequate training was provided or no training at all was provided to individuals. This has to be done before the employee is exposed to a fall hazard as part of their assigned duties. Um, no specific planning. So again, they didn't, they tried to bring a system that wasn't designed for what they're doing. Um, so when you deal with flat roofs, it's a completely different system than if you're dealing with a pitched roof. Um, some places you may be able to use a self-retractor, some places not. Uh, so making sure that you look at the job beforehand and select the equipment based upon what you're doing. Um, if you have a standing seam roof, uh, a metal roof with a standing seam on it, you cannot use the traditional type anchors on those unless you remove the ridge cap. Now you're going to have to buy a specific anchor that's made for that. Uh, fall protection systems or equipment not provided, improperly used, improper anchor points, or equipment not sized for employees. Uh, one size does not fit all on harnesses. If you take a look at harnesses, they are weighted. They'll tell you they're for individuals of certain body types. Um, so making sure that you provide the correct harness for someone um, so that they can wear it correctly. And when they wear it, making sure that it's not so big that when they wrench them down, they still can't get uh, the between the leg straps and the seat has to sit um, under the, the buttocks properly. If it doesn't, what ends up happening is when this individual falls, it creates greater injury to this individual because with the loose slack, anything that gets trapped between that and the strap it is is going to get pulled up with it, uh, much like a seatbelt while you're wearing the while you're wearing it in a car. Go ahead, Ralph. So basically, plan ahead. You know, make sure you're providing training for all the employees on the job. Make sure that you've figured out what you should be using for appropriate fall protection for each hazard that you're going to encounter. Provide the correct equipment for the job. Like Brett had said, one size does not fit all. And then train your supervisors and employees to correct the conditions before the accident occurs. Many times I've seen supervisors walk right by a fall hazard that's in progress and they completely ignored it. And, you know, been doing this for 38 years. It's one of those where you just, you have to take the time, stop, correct the condition. All right. Moving on, number six, lockout, tagout. So with this, there were 1698 violations in 2021, uh, approximately 60 fatalities per year, and almost 3,000 lost time injuries. Now this is a, your typical lockout center where you have your tags, you have your locks. And the one thing that I, you know, quickly, I'll use the term keyed in on was the one master lock sitting there and it's got two keys to it. Brett, I'm going to let you talk about that one. 
Um, so with lockout tagout, uh, only one key is supposed to be provided per lock. Um, typically when you buy this type of center, then there's one master key that's kept by the um, administrator of the program that's kept under control where other employees don't have access to that in case of a, the need to remove a lock between shifts or something like that. Um, so that, but this type of lock is, is not designed to be used as a lockout device. And, and again, if you, if it did happen to be used, the problem with the two keys being together uh, is, is a violation also. Um, so this one, lack of proper training, the first thing you have to do is identify what type of employees that you have. Are they authorized or are they affected? Um, so the, the number one key is, is if you have to apply a lock to something, you are authorized. If you are affected by somebody applying a lock, you are an affected employee. Okay. Um, if you work further down an assembly area and they lock out the beginning of it, you would be an affected employee because the action somebody took farther down the line would be the individual um, that was authorized and you were affected by that lockout tagout. Um, Failure to lock out all power sources. Um, it, it's natural for most individuals to look directly at, oh, it's a direct you know, 220 or, or 408 circuit. I locked that out. Uh, don't forget pneumatic. Don't forget steam, um, uh, hydraulic. Uh, your machine might have several different sources of energy. Some other things to take a look at also is, do you have storage devices within that machinery? Do you have capacitors that need to be discharged? Do you have a capacitor with a timer? Um, that it's, it's a fail safe for certain devices that allow it to cycle at least once in the event of a power failure. You need to make sure you're looking at these machines because they're unique situations that have to be addressed um, for locking out. Uh, failure to test perform, performing maintenance and repairs. So again, making sure that you verified that what you did to this machine to stop the hazardous energy from causing an unanticipated startup or action is actually working. Uh, it is a requirement to do an audit on every one of your procedures yearly. And that's the purpose of it is to make sure that what you suggested actually takes the hazards away. Looks like you have a question, Reynolds. Uh, just, just a hand was raised and ju just a quick reminder um, because we are on oh. Zoom, it's unlike, this is unlike a Zoom meeting. So we won't ever be able to see or hear our attendees. So um, if you do have a question, just type it into the, the chat or the Q&A uh, and we'll get to that. But yeah, no specific question yet, Brett. Okay. So I, I just want to make sure before we went too far. Um, yep, so thanks. again, making sure that employees understand that in part of performing the lockout tagout procedure is to make sure that the hazardous energy has been locked out and cannot harm the person, you know, the repairs that are being done. Um, also understanding the difference between maintenance and repair and normal machine operation too. So um, there's a lot of confusion that deals with that. So knowing that, go ahead, Ralph. Basically you have to have a written program. You have to train all authorized and affected employees and as Brett had said, the authorized employees are the ones that are putting the locks on. The affected employees are the ones that usually work in that area or even could be passing by the area, you know, but somehow they're, they're affected by it. Uh, test your machinery equipment to confirm it is locked out correctly following documented procedures for that equipment prior to working on it. Each piece of equipment or machinery is uh, usually provided by the manufacturer with a proper lockout procedure on the machine. You want to make sure that you're following that procedure. Unfortunately, you know, I can remember being 32 years old, which was many years ago at this point, had a, an electrician up in the mills in the uh, western end of the state. He and his dad were working, going to work on a, a line. The mill had locked it out for them. So he clipped into it and lost his life because they had locked out the wrong line. So, you know, it's it always, always, always trust but verify. You know, you want to make sure that you're you're checking that to make sure everything is shut down so you, you, you don't get caught in it. And then, of course, you know, follow all the lockout tagout procedures in the order prescribed. And then on an annual basis, you want to basically review and, and test your people that are involved in doing the lockout tag out just to make sure that they're still doing things properly. All right, it's about halfway through here. Um, 
just a quick note. I, th I think this was stated uh, in the written material. We, we are planning to go till 1130, um, although we may end a bit early, but just for your timing planning. All right, number five here, hazard communication uh, is, so almost 2000 violations for this one and 672 worker fatalities in 2020. Um, and these unintentional overdoses, you're gonna see why in a minute here with mislabeling and uh, separate containers, things like that. But this caused, and this may surprise some, it surprised me a little bit, 388 fatalities. So a uh, bigger issue than you might think here. Yeah, this one, common thing, people don't realize how hazardous winter washer fluid is, especially in winter. You'll see it's got a minus 20 or so degree, you know, rating on it. It's got a lot of alcohol in it. The alcohol typically is a methyl alcohol or methanol, and you cannot necessarily make it non-poisonous. Unfortunately, once in a once in a while, probably every once to three, three to five years, we'll read about a, an, an OSHA fatal facts where somebody put a little bit into the other guy's, you know, blue Gatorade thinking they're going to be funny. And unfortunately, the other person dies from it. This, it's flammable. It's poisonous. You know, treat it as if it's a bottle of gasoline. And then, of course, labeling, you know, hazard communication. They have to have labels for each one of the chemicals so that you know what it is. As, as it says here, you know, is this iced tea? It was sitting on the floor. Actually, it was some kind of a hydraulic fluid, but nobody removed the label. So once again, labeling issue. Um, many reasons for this. Uh, probably the largest one is not having a written hazard communication program. So in other words, your program has to uh, address things like um, a, a chemical inventory. What do you have? What have you had in your establishment? Um, how you're going to accomplish the training with individuals, employees uh, that come in, uh, how you handle the reception of, of hazardous materials. Um, again, that goes hand in hand with training because the training is actually in the written program. You do have to keep, this is another one of the, the few um, requirements that has documentation requirements attached to it. So you must document that the training was done. Um, SDS is not readily available to employees. Um, there's a lot of different ways to have them available. Uh, some people choose to put them on computers. It is allowed to be put on a computer, but however, it cannot be in an office that is ever locked. It has to be 100% accessible at all times to employees. It cannot be on a computer that has a password that has to be locked. And again, it has to be accessible to employees at all times. Um, most of them go with uh, just having the printed document in the right to know places, which is fine. Um, that's acceptable. It's 100% within compliance. Uh, just understand this, that if you no longer carry a uh, particular chemical, if you did have it in your establishment, employees may have been exposed to it. That SDS sheet has to be archived and saved for a minimum of 30 years. So that if at any time you did use it as part of your program, um, you used a particular type of oil or lubricant that's no longer uh, kept there, you have to keep that for 30 years after the last point it was used in the establishment. Um, no or improper labeling. So again, secondary containers, um, individuals will find all kinds of creative ways to move um, from bulk storage to, to smaller containers, making sure that they are properly labeled. Um, and making sure that you put what the what the actual product is, uh, not its slang name, that it may be known by other individuals in the establishment, what is actually in there, so that when the individual does become accidentally exposed to it, they know what SDS sheet to go to. Brett, can you can you give a few examples of common um, hazardous materials, like for especially for anyone on this call who's not in an industry where they're using like really in, intense stuff, right? Just like cleaning supplies. And what are, what are some common ones that you would suggest paying attention to? Uh, common ones, particularly, you know, with the, with the advent of cleaning with, um, with COVID, you're looking at sanitizers that have been mixed from a bulk container storage, um, bleach and water, sometimes that occurs. Um, don't forget, even in an office setting, if you have a very large industrial shredder, you have to apply shredder oil to it every now and then, or the blades dull or destroy themselves. Uh, that has to be labeled. If it's put in a secondary container, let's say you get it in a gallon container, and then you put it in a smaller uh, squirt bottle type that allows you to, to effectively um, 
uh, lubricate the jaws or the uh, the blades, uh, you need to make sure that that's labeled. Um, there is some labeling requirements different to commercially avail or I'm sorry, consumer products. So if it is a consumer product that is available in a quantity and a strength that is available to the general public, it does not necessarily have to have a specific label. It can have the original label on it. I'm just gonna choose Windex, for instance. If you have a bottle of Windex that is regular strength, not a special industrial strength, or a, you know, in a 55 gallon drum, because most consumers don't purchase that, uh, it is acceptable because the warnings are inside of the label itself. It's usually that expandable label, and that is covered by the Consumer Protection Act. Um, however, if you get something that is caustic, uh, like oven cleaner, even though it is a commercially available product because it is caustic, you also have to have the SDS for that, and you have to make sure that the label is on the container. Um, did that answer your question, or would you like me to go further? No, that was that was great. That's exactly the kind of thing I was looking for. Thanks, Brett. Brett, um, Brett, could you also just tell them, you know, your typical, I'll call it homemade label. What are the few requirements that they have to have on each one of those labels? Uh, you have to have any health or, or, or um, signatory where there's, if it's poisonous, bad for the environment, uh, that those stickers so have to be the on there. The little pictograms that come with the GHS uh, program, which is the globally homogenized system, um, that was developed originally because individuals who have trouble reading, they can identify quickly from the pictures what the hazards are associated with something. So it brought everybody into the fold because pictures span across multiple languages, uh, multiple cultures. Everybody kind of understands what a skull and crossbones means. Uh, some may see death, some may see toxicity, but all in all, people know that's a bad thing. So if you see that on a piece on a product, you know, you're going to have to take a look at um, what exactly is it that's that's hazardous about this product. Um, and then the name of the product, what is in there? Um, is it motor oil? Is it, uh, is it shredder lubrication oil? What exactly is in there? Um, and again, this is if somebody were to accidentally be exposed to it, spill it, uh, get it on their skin, you know where to go to get the information. So that would be the bare minimum of what's required on there. How about the manufacturer's name? Does that have to be on there or phone number? Not necessarily. It, it depends on the product. Again, if it's a, if it's a CPA covered product, so like Windex again, everything's on that label. Uh, so it really depends on the product itself. Okay, thanks. Gotcha. Right, so basically everyone has to have a written hazard communication program. And the other part of that is it's a good idea to make sure your program is updated. Many times I'll run into, you know, ask a company, do you have a hazard communication program? They'll go, yes, they'll pull it off the shelf. The date on it is 1998, uh, 2004, something along those lines. And, and you could tell from the amount of dust on it that they haven't looked at it recently at least annually, it's a good idea just to go through and make sure everything's up to date and especially your SDSs should be up to date. Training of employees by a qualified person, you know, you wanna make sure whoever's doing the training knows what they're talking about for hazard communication. You know, there's specific training requirements that they have to abide by. So you wanna make sure you have the right people doing the training. Routine area inspections, be sure employees are working correctly. What I mean by that is that they're using the chemicals correctly. They've got the proper PPE in place and they know what the chemical is and what it's for and what the hazards are. And of course, proper labeling of all the containers. You know, these are just some of the highlights. Um, I just got two quick things to add real quick. Um, dealing with proper labeling also, um, there are some instances where if it is a single use and will never leave the control of the person who has the container, um, you may not have to label that container. One example would be if you worked at a printing company and you had to get a small amount of ink to add to say you were printing napkins or you work for one of the companies that does um, imprinting of uh, logos on t-shirts, stuff like that. If the person is going to the bulk container, discharging a small cup of the paint, goes, puts it in the machine and immediately disposes of that container, that's allowed. But if at any time that individual puts that container down for any such reason, then yes, it has to have a label on it. Um, is making sure that em em employees understand that too. Great. Nice. nice. 
Great stuff on that one. And a quick reminder as I move on to the next one, we do have the OSHA codes here. Um, so when you get the PDF, if you wanna look into greater detail, um, this is all easily accessible information. Um, all right, moving on, number four, scaffolding. Uh, so back to some fall stuff, uh, almost 2000 violations, about 60 deaths annually from falls from scaffolds specifically, and uh, about 4,500 injuries annually. Now this is a picture of a nice scaffold system. This is actually over at Western Mass Hospital. And basically you can see they did a lot of planning and you know when before they erected this, they've got fall protection up on the roof from when they were doing some roofing work. They've got stairwells. Uh, it just was a nice looking system. Then there's the not so nice looking system where basically they threw up some frames through maybe a platform, then again, it might be a ladder, it looks like a platform, onto the top of the thing, and then they have it supported by the uh, step ladder over to the left on the roof of the uh, structure with the ladder in a closed position. That's the additional support. Next. Uh, another, another nice siding job going on. You see the, the blue step ladder, the wood plank for the fortunate individual siding that section, along with a couple of uh, little giant ladders, the little platform. And then you'll notice on the left side, you've got another ladder that extends up for when they want to climb up onto the roof without fall protection. And the ladder does not extend a minimum three feet over. And as far as the uh, four to one ratio for setting up a ladder, that was fairly suspect too. Brett, you got anything you want to add? Uh, a couple of things to remember, uh, siding jobs, particularly residential, um, is remembering the amount of power that goes through those feeder lines. Um, you know, every house is equipped with, uh, the majority of homes today are equipped with some type of 220 circuit in it. Uh, so again, you're going to have three lines coming in, um, is making sure that you're not allowed within three feet of these lines, unless you are a qualified person, which most siders and roofers are not qualified individuals. Um, ways to take care of this is you can contact a local power company and have them come out and put guarding on that. They are qualified to move the lines and guard them in a way so that if you accidentally contact these, uh, you won't be in danger of uh, getting a rather large shock or worse, getting electrocuted. Thank you. Again, we saw this picture earlier, just talking about the same things, fall protection, access, power line safety. Uh, training and education. Uh, training has to be provided to employees on how to properly work on scaffolds, how to identify when pieces are missing from scaffolds. Um, how to use the different parts and put them together. Uh, this is one of the one of the ones that requires a competent person when you're erecting or dismantling or moving the scaffolding um, is making sure that a competent person is on site when this is done. Uh, the instructions on how to do it also have to be on site when they do this uh, to make sure they're following the erection properly. Not installed or used in accordance to the manufacturer's instructions. So again, making sure that's a reference for that. Um, one common one that we see are pump jack scaffolds. Pump jack scaffolds will tell you, uh, the, the most of them will say you have to have an upper brace until you put the extension on, then you put a lower brace on. Uh, however, OSHA regulations require an upper and a lower regardless. So there has to be some type of lower, either triangular bracing or pinning of the bottom of it to prevent kick out. Um, where you'll find that on the pump jacks is there's a line, I believe it's either 12 or 13 that says must follow all uh, state, county and federal regulations, otherwise not stated on this. So in other words, it's saying, well, we don't require a triangular bracing as the manufacturer, but however OSHA does. And again, that's because of the number of kickout accidents that we see uh, with pump jack scaffolds. Um, the guardrails are missing or simply not there at all. Uh, remember with welded tubular scaffolding that the cross bracing, depending on where the intersection is, can either be used as the top rail or the mid rail, but not both. Uh, so remember that uh, you may have to add additional bracing into there too close to power lines. Again, if you'll notice, most of these things are made of highly conductive materials. Uh, most scaffolding is either made of steel or aluminum. Uh, you may find some old wooden pump jack scaffolds out there, 
you may find some old wooden scaffolds out there, uh, but the majority of them are made of highly conductive materials, so metal and aluminum, making sure that you're nowhere near these lines. Um, understand that lines that come into residential structures, the coating that is on the outside of that line is not an insulator. It is not designed in any way to insulate from power. They get micro cracks in them all the time from the weather. They're designed to prevent uh, squirrels and birds and things like that from damaging the line, causing a short out, causing a fire, um, incidental contact from tree branches, things like that. That's what that coating is designed to do is to protect the wire inside. It is not to contain um, any hazards with it. If the potential outside of that line is greater, it will leave a micro crack and enter wherever the potential is. That could be the scaffold, the person, or the tool that's near it. Thanks, Brett. As Brett said earlier, a competent person should be supervising the erection and dismantling of the scaffolds. Only qualified and trained personnel should be erecting or dismantling the scaffolds with the competent person supervising. And of course, only trained personnel should be using the scaffolds. Access to scaffolds, you know, it's got to be proper. This is why people fall. A lot of times we've seen, you know, people climbing up the uh, cross braces of the scaffolds to access them, you know, or climbing un up, under, and through, you know, it, climbing over the guardrails. It's just all not ways to be accessing them properly. As far as safety equipment, making sure guardrails, mid rails, tow boards, screens, access ladders, and stairs, you know, they should all be utilized. And of course, I had put stay 10 feet or more from live electrical power. I hate electricity. Too easy uh, just, to just one more thing, Ralph. Um, when it Thanks. comes to safe access of scaffolds, uh, you have scaffolds out there that are called pass through scaffolds. Some call them mason masonry scaffolds. They'll have a tapered end on either side and it'll have things that look like ladder rungs. Uh, no, those are vertical support. They are not ladders. They do not meet the intention of a ladder. There are scaffolds that have ladders actually as part of the outer frame. In order to tell if it's a proper ladder is either it's going to be marked as such or A, it's going to follow the ANSI standards, meaning that it has to be no more than 12 inches uh, from center of rung to center of rung. They need to be equally spaced. Uh, they have to be a particular width, which is at least one inch of, of grabbable bar. Uh, if you look at most of these pass-through ones, they taper and then they're at irregular intervals, so they are not a ladder. Climbing that is a violation. Thanks, Reynolds, could I interject just quickly? Yeah, um, yeah. Good you point. know, as we're talking about these things like scaffolding, um, you know, falling from heights, you know, one thing if you're if you're hiring contractors that are going to work under you, if you're the GC or even a sub hiring another sub, one thing you really want to make sure you have in place is a strong subcontractor agreement. Again, the the OSHA compliance is obviously a key component here, but when when we're talking to underwriters, the number one thing they're asking about is if, if you're hiring folks that are going to do this work, what does that agreement look like? How are you risk transferring it back to them? Because it's their responsibility to set these things up safely. And what are their insurance programs and safety programs? So I think as you're, as you're especially, you know, with falls from heights or setting up scaffolding, you know, especially these higher hazard operations, You've got to make sure you've got a strong subcontractor agreement in place with the with the right risk transfer in it. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Super important. So speaking of ladders, ladders is number three. So a lot of these things are tied together. Um, and ladders, I, I would imagine everyone on this call has ladders in your business somewhere. <laughs> uh, over 2,000 violations, uh, about 240 falls annually from ladders just in the construction space alone and over 5,000 serious injuries to employees from ladders. Uh, big, big issue here. This is a close up from that earlier picture. Yeah, using ladders safely. Make sure they're trained. Next one. So Ralph, what the, you mentioned the before being on the top rung, but there's something else going on here, right? You got you got the the parallel well, feet, right? He's got, yeah, he's got one foot up on the other side. I had mentioned that earlier. Basically, those are just braces. You know, this was a, a single-sided stepladder, you know, where you only had the steps on one side and the other side was just the braces. You're not allowed to be first off standing like that, but you never climb the braces. Yep. This is one I found on a job site. 
you know, as you can see, it's, it's in beautiful condition. You know, as soon as you get a ladder like that, get rid of it. When you do dispose of it, make it so that nobody else can pull it back out of the dumpster and use it because if they fall from it, they can actually sue you. So it's best to, best to destroy them, cut them right down the rungs so that they're not usable. Next one. Storing ladders. When you store them, they, if they're in anything but laying flat or open and set up properly, you really should have them secured so that they can't fall over and hit somebody else. And then the green ladder to the right, you know, that green ladder's got a 225 pound rating. It's a type two versus a type one, type one A or type one AA, which would give a minimum of a 250 pound rating. Those, the 250 pound and up have a construction rating according to the ANSI standard. The green ones do not. Those are more of a uh, moderate light duty type situation. If you end up with uh, aluminum ladders with the red caps on them, more than likely those are a 200 pound duty rating. They're, they're you know, a light duty rating, otherwise known as household duty rating. Don't, they don't belong on a job site whatsoever. Next one. And again, we've got this one, you know, Using a ladder as part of a scaffold, you know, especially on the right side, the blue ladder, they're not designed for that. Therefore, you shouldn't be doing it. Brett, do you have anything you want to add to that? Nope. Uh, just, just make sure that the ladder is actually designed. There are some ladder scaffold systems out there. Um, but again, th those systems have specific parts with them. So another violation dealing with that would be mixing different parts. Um, so in this, that that planking between the two little giants appears to be a pick that came off of either a ladder jack system uh, or a, um, uh, the, um, I apologize, a pump jack system. So it's not designed for this one. Little giant comes out with its own picks that, that are designed to be used in that type of ladder system. And then making sure again, it's, it's gotta be at least 12 inches. Thanks. Right, I think we lost your video there. I don't know if that was. I apologize. <laughs> you're you're good. You're good. Um, so with this, again, no or poor ladder safety training for employees. Um, a lot of people seem to take these these things for granted and say, "Well, everybody knows how to use a ladder." Um, but I I've talked to people just uh, on inspections and and away from inspections, and and a lot of people don't know what's on half of those warning labels, and, and that's not good. You should know what's on the warning labels. You should know what the ladder is used for. Uh, and again, one of the biggest things that we we find is that uh, employees or employers have used a ladder for the purpose by which it was not designed. Um, so if it was not designed to be used as a scaffold, it shouldn't be used as used as a scaffold. If it's a supported ladder or what we call an A-frame ladder, um, <clears throat> those lock bars have to be locked in the position that they are. There are some A-frame ladders that are specifically designed to be used folded, but however, they don't look like regular A-frame ladders and they'll have markings on them that say that they can be used that way. Um, so again, making sure that you train your employees how to use it. Don't take for granted that somebody should know how to use a ladder or what it's used for. Um, Equipment in poor condition are not regularly inspected, not used in accordance, as we spoke earlier, the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, so again, with anything, um, failing to plan is planning to fail. So what I mean by that is, is, is you don't send an employee to a job with one ladder that's six foot and, and hope that they can reach everywhere that they need to go. Because what will end up happening is either A, you're going to have a person coming back to get the right ladder, or they're going to do what this individual did, and they're going to straddle the ladder and stand on areas that they shouldn't be standing on. Again, to access heights, they need to have a selection of tools and at their disposal, and that includes the ladders also. So making sure that when you know the job, you look at the job, and you give the right equipment to the employees to use, the, use it safely. Uh, again, using them too close to power lines. A lot of these are made of aluminum, uh, very highly conductive material. Uh, even fiberglass ones still have aluminum rungs in them. So making sure that you understand what the safe approach distances are uh, and don't use them close to power lines. Go ahead, Ralph. Basically, have a ladder safety program, train your employees, make sure they know how to use the ladder, read the warnings. Uh, routine ladder and employee daily use inspections. You know, many times I've found ladders on jobs or even in manufacturing facilities, the ladder's not in very good shape and nobody's, nobody's inspecting them. 
And, you know, basically the employees on a daily basis before they use a ladder, they should be checking it, make sure it's in good condition. You want to make sure the employee knows how to inspect it. And then once a month or so, especially in construction, it's worthwhile to have somebody go through and really take a good look at all the ladders. And then, of course, retraining and discipline is needed. Uh, just one more thing to add to that. Um, also, knowing the limitations of the particular ladders, um, with fiberglass ladders, you find a lot, they'll be strapped to the top of vans where they, they go to and from. And part of your inspections is making sure, particularly with fiberglass ladders, you are looking at those risers. You're looking for cracking, spalling, um, parts of the fiberglass actually pulling apart from the um, glue that's, or the epoxy that's used to join it together. These are indications that those risers are actually starting to fail. And remember, these things are exposed to the elements. They're exposed to sunlight, they're exposed to rain, extreme heat and cold. And over time, this can weaken a ladder. And they'll tell you on the warnings when you're doing the inspections to look for this and that if those uh, do appear that you need to get rid of the ladder. Great. Um, and I noticed an error up there. It says scaffolding. I'll make sure to fix that before we, uh, we are on number uh, three for ladders instead. Okay. Coming around the bend here. So number two, we're getting to these top two most cited violations, respiratory protection. So for data, this one's a little interesting, right? So you see the violations, just over 2,500, but the number of deaths and serious injuries on this one is really hard to calculate because not using proper respiratory protection is usually a longer term effect and the death is or the injury is attributed to the condition. Um, so it's really hard to track it, but it's it's clearly a big issue given the number of violations. And I know, you know, masks and respiration is on everyone's mind for a lot of reasons right now. Um, but there are a couple things to keep in mind about this one. Right. Respirators, you know, storage and cleaning. You want to make sure that they're stored properly. They're clean before they're stored. You can see the dust that's accumulated on this one. Don't know how long it's been out. You know, how often are they changing the filters? Are they doing fit testing? You know, are they medically qualifying people that are using them, et cetera? Brett, you want to add? Um, so in number one, when I see something like this, I look at two problems. Number one is, is obviously the storage issue, but the first thing I think of is training. Obviously, individuals have not been trained in how to properly care for these. Um, they are pieces of personal protective equipment and they require very specific care. Uh, there's a reason it comes with a storage bag that's for storing your respirator in. Um, also, you know, again, in this one, you have a combination filter. You have a P100, which looks like it's attached to an organic vapor cartridge. Um, so is there a swap out schedule? Um, how often are these supposed to be swapped out? Storage, once again, you know, looking at these, these two, one, I, you know, I call it a glorified dust mask you know, on the left. And then of course you have a filtering face piece respirator and you can see that the filters are, are dirty. Storage again, you know, how are they storing them? What are they using them for? Do they have the correct filtration? You know, things like that. If, they're, if you're doing spray painting for any reason and you're using the one on the left, is it, is it gonna work for you? I don't think so, because it's not designed for that. Uh, one other thing to add about that picture, uh, never store a respirator is suspended on its straps. Um, you, when, if you take the elasticity out of it, you'll, you'll never be able to get the, it to function properly. It won't secure to your face. Um, so it, it, that's the number one rule is never, ever suspend it from its, um, from its, uh, from its strapping. Thanks, Brad. Um, so some of the reasons engineering or administrative controls not implemented when possible. So one thing you have to look at is, is it required to have respiratory protection or is it voluntary? So you're going to start there. If any of the processes that you do have a regulation or the manufacturer says you have to be wearing respiratory protection with this, it now goes into the, the mandatory phase. Um, if it's kind of a, a well, we, we use it for dust or something like that for, for comfort. Um, then again, if it's the voluntary one, depending on the type of respirator it is, again, we'll determine whether or not you have to have a written program. Uh, training, even if it is a voluntary um, program, you must provide training to the employee. 
proper care, use, and selection. Obviously, you can't take a filtering face piece into an oxygen deficient environment. It doesn't generate oxygen. All it's designed to do is filter out whatever contaminant is in there. So you want to make sure that uh, that, that is properly selected. Um, again, I, I know with respiratory protection, there's the whole issue with um, COVID and stuff like this. But what we're talking about is just general respiratory protection. Um, respirator not designed for the task. So again, you're taking a filtering face piece into a oxygen deficient environment. That, that's a problem. Um, trying to use a P100 filter with an organic solvent. Well, it will stop some of the vape, some of the, um, the dust and the solid pieces from coming into the respirator, but it will not stop the actual organic vapors from entering into the respirator. Um, use of a respirator without medical qualification. Um, so that being said, when you start looking at tight fitting um, respirators, elastomeric, full face, um, CPAPers, things like that, you have to have medical qualifications. When you put a respirator in front of someone, now we're not talking about a face piece, a mask, um, we're talking about a respirator here. Uh, it does put a amount of um, pressure on an individual cardiovascularly, and they need to make sure medically that they're qualified to wear this, particularly if they're going to be doing a task that is, um, it, it involves a lot of energy and an individual doing certain things. Um, no or improper fit. Again, respirators are not one size fits all. Uh, you may find that an employee doesn't fit a 3M, they fit a North uh, so you may have to go to a different size with North um, or other respiratory uh, protection providers. Uh, some of them have multi sizes, like they may have a medium large and then a large and then a medium, or some may just say small, medium and large. So again, everybody's faces are a little bit different. Something else to keep aware of is if you have significant weight loss or weight gain, you may not fit the same respirator that you did before. Um, so if you, you had a medical condition or, you know, you decided, uh, one day to lose a lot of weight, um, or you, you got into muscle building or something like that, remember it, as your face changes, so does the piece of equipment that's going to properly fit your face. Uh, it looks like I might have a couple of questions. No, it's just, uh, okay. we were noting the, the error that we're going to fix on the slides. So okay. No worries there. All right, Ralph. Such as this one with the scaffolding. Yeah, again. there it is again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make oh, no, I missed thing. that. Yeah. All right. So basically, you know, you want to make sure you have your engineering or administrative controls in place, along with respirators if needed. Written respirator program and training. You know, it's it's crucial to make sure that people that are going to use respirators know how to use them, know what they're for, know what they're not capable of such as Brett was alluding to earlier, you know, many times I've run into people using a, uh, I'll call them a, a dust mask, you know, for an N95 and basically they're spray painting with them. You get absolutely no help with that as, you know, it'll keep the particulate out, but it won't keep the vapors out. Respirator selection must fit the tasks and the, and the employee, as Brett was saying, qualification of employees before wearing respirators. You know, the last thing you want to do is have somebody strap on a respirator, do a uh, physically demanding task, and then you find out that they had medical issues that they really shouldn't have been wearing a respirator. And last, I've also got no or limited facial hair. You cannot impede the respirator seal. Quick story on that. Had a friend call me up asking me about respirators. He says, I have a, a heavy beard. Uh, is an N95 going to do me any good? And bottom line, no, because there's no way you can make a seal with that thing. So, you know, you can have limited facial hair as long as it fits inside the respirator and doesn't impede the seal. Correct, Brett? That's correct. When you're, when you're talking about uh, the, the respiratory program, yes. Thank All you. All right. So moving on to number one. The tension has been building. <laughs> All right, fall protection. So we, we saw this once that I think it was number seven about training, but here it is again, number one, the number one cited uh, violation with over 5,000 in 2021, uh, in 2020, over 350 fall deaths in, just in construction and over 25,000 falls, slips, trips, 
Um, and in construction, that's about a third of the accidents annually. So obviously a really, really big issue with that one. Uh, this is a nice picture from JJ Keller, basically showing people working on a flat roof and everybody's tied off. You know, they've got their harnesses, got their lanyards, got their anchor points. I didn't study it too thoroughly to check that one anchor point, you know, to the left there, but it, it just seemed like a, a nice picture to put in there just to show people this is what it looks like. And this is what it doesn't look like. Yes, they're on a ladder, but it's still a training issue, you know, for fall protection. Got a step ladder that's being used in a closed position. It's not designed for it. It's only up a couple steps. So if he does fall, he shouldn't get seriously injured. Just, you know, maybe break his ankle or something. But that's a good point. You don't have to fall very far to hurt yourself. No, you don't. <laughs> something to think about. So it's not just Especially construction. Especially as we get older. <laughs> And of course, you know, looking at this, I'm, this was sent to me by a friend and, you know, looking at it, I wasn't too sure, but it almost looks like they may have set the ladder up on the roof itself. And then you've got the bracket. And of course, you got the power line coming in right there. And, you know, the minute I saw that picture, I just cringed too many ways of falling on that one. Uh, so again, the, the the number one problem with fall protection is because either they weren't trained on how to recognize when they have to have fall protection, when they need it, what type they need. Um, so again, that that's the biggest one is is educating the employees of of how to identify hazards and situations that may expose them to a fall. Um, inadequate systems or equipment. Uh, most of the time with this, what we find is, is they'll have a system and it's just completely installed incorrectly. Um, most of the time with the, the roofing industry, what we find is, is they'll have what's called a, a flap anchor, which is a, a double-sided anchor that is supposed to fit over a ridge or along a, um, a truss or a uh, rafter. Um, they'll nail it in. Uh, in the older models, uh, pre-90s, early 2000s, you could fill it up full of 16 penny nails and that was acceptable to the manufacturer. The newer ones do not allow that. They want three inch um, stainless steel screws. The screws come with the kit. They give you a reorder form in case they go out. Um, there are other types out there that have to use lag bolts. It just depends on what the particular system is. Um, and again, it'll have a pattern that must be used in order to meet the 5,000 pound requirement. Um, employees hate using it. Myself as an iron worker, I've worked for over 20 years. Uh, it gets in the way. It's cumbersome. Yes, it is. Um, but what it's designed to do is to save your life in the event of a fall. Remember, uh, our, our number one um, wish for anything, any job is to engineer out the hazard. But sometimes you just can't get rid of a fall hazard. When you're on a roof, it's, it's always going to be there. You can't take the roof off the house or the building and build it on the ground. You have to build it where it is. So in other words, you can't really get rid of the hazard. So now what I've got to do is I've got to minimize the risk. You don't minimize the risk when you don't use these systems properly. Uh, another, another key common one that we find is, is that you'll have a lifeline with a rope grab. They'll pull the rope grab all the way down to the edge of the roof so that they can move freely up and down from side to side. They'll have it at more than a 15 degree angle. Um, Cause again, it's cumbersome. We understand that, but understand this, when you don't use it that way, you will go over the side. Once you go over the side of the leading edge, how much lanyard do you have? Uh, typically you've got to have over 13 feet of free of distance for that system to deploy. Sometimes they're as much as 18 feet. It depends on the size of the person. It depends on the lanyard. Um, and it depends on, our, is it a fall restraint or a fall arrest system? So you have to look at all of these things when you do that. So that kind of falls into the reasons that people get violations for this is improper systems and no training. So you wanna plan your jobs with your fall protection methods in mind. You know, provide job specific fall protection systems and training to your employees. Regularly inspect your job sites to make certain that fall protection is utilized and retrain and discipline is needed. You know, the, uh, it's really unfortunate when you run in, you go onto a job site, you find out somebody's fallen, everybody's got fall protection equipment, they've been trained how to use it, but 
that one person said, well, I'm only going to, you know, it's only going to take me a minute to do this. So I'm not going to bother with it. And sure enough, off they go, you know, fall off the roof, fall off the scaffold, whatever they were doing, you know, because they bypassed a, a safety uh, protocol. Brett, anything to add? I have nothing. Okay. All right. So we got a few minutes left. I'm going to hand this back to Matt for just a, a quick overview of how we help our clients with this kind of thing and how we how it relates to insurance just for probably two minutes and then we'll leave a couple minutes for any remaining questions at the end yeah i mean i think like i said in the beginning it's it's really really important that you're looking at this holistically um you know safety compliance it really ties into overall risk management so we've developed a platform called risk which we do know how to spell <laughs> um, but we got creative from a marketing standpoint. And again, risk stands for risk management, insurance, safety, and compliance. And, and, and as I said in the beginning, to drive down costs of insurance, you need to take a holistic approach to this and look at all aspects from how you manage your subs, how do you risk transfer with those subs, um, how do you look at safety, do you have the right programs, and have you built a culture that um, promotes safety? Um, that's really, really important. And that's what we talk about with our clients. So certainly if you're a client and you need help in this area, reach out to us. We've got a lot of resources. Um, if you're not a client and you're interested in talking to us about this, again, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk to you. But let's Great. leave some time for some questions. And uh, and again, I appreciate everyone joining us this morning. Great. So yeah, just give it a pa quick pause here. If anybody has anything or anything that wasn't discussed, I'll also mention that, um, as I as I said, I'll send this these slides out as a PDF after I correct those quick little errors I made there, uh, and the recording of this. And I will encourage you to respond to that email if you have more detailed questions or questions you may not want to present here in this format. Um, we can get those along to Brett and Ralph, and happy to help you in any way. So, not seeing anything, we're just a couple minutes early here. Um, I really want to, I want to take a minute to thank Brett. You know, we really appreciate the time you spent with your day and your expertise. You are uh, clearly have been doing this for a long time and have some great insight. I know there's it's a lot more detail there and it's awesome to have you as a resource. So thanks so much, Brett. We really appreciate it. No problem. All right. I think that's it. Thank you everyone for joining. I'll be in touch uh, later today with all the materials and uh, stay safe out there, everybody. That's our last slide. There's, Who's that, Ralph? Is that yours? My grandson, Killian. That's right. Just a reminder that uh, a lot of us have families relying on us to stay safe out there. So that's always uh, number one. So thanks, everybody. Enjoy your day, and we'll be in touch. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.